Well, good evening or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a uh, Around Town with Bill Crane show. And this is something that uh, I would like to do with different folks that have interesting stories for us or just interesting folks to visit with. And today we have Brenda Zolli uh, with us and of course my partner Dwayne. So um, with, this is just going to be um, like three old friends sitting around batting the breeze. So with that said and done, Brenda, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Brenda uh, lives in Pondville, right? No. No. In Pondville? I no, thought... I live in Norfolk. Yes, I know that, but in the No, Pondville... I live in uh, near Stanhope Drive. Uh, oh, yeah, it's okay. I was literally. thinking of another Brenda Zolli. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> Give a bunch of them. You go get them all. You made us a bunch of this. <laughs> right. But anyway, uh, sorry for that clumsy beginning, folks, but nonetheless, it'll get worse. Um, no, it'll get better. Um, so anyway, we've asked Brenda to come on, and Brenda has uh, led an interesting life. And um, as you may have caught a little sample of, there's a British accent. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So tell us, Brenda, where were you born? I was born in London in 1940, um, just as World War II was breaking out. Um, we lived there for a couple of years during the war, for the first two years of the war, and then we later moved out of London into the country because of the bombing. Right. And you were quite interested in... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you must have early memories of... Um... Well, because I was an infant, I, didn't, I don't really remember right. the war per se because, um, you know, I was too young. But I, I have very good memories, vivid memories, from about, I was probably be three or four uh, when we moved. So you were evacuated from London? No, not, not necessarily. The children were taken out of London and put on trains and sent to the country with a label around their neck. No, my family moved. My mother, uh, my mother had, uh, she married, they, my parents got married just at the outbreak of the war and I was born early. I was a premature baby. Um, and then by the time the war was over, my mother had five, four children. Okay. And then had, later had another one. So she, we had, there were six of us all together. So in how long did you stay up country, if you will? Well, we moved to Yorkshire, which is in the north of England. Um, my father and mother were from an area there where, where we moved to. We lived in a little village. Um, my memories are quite clear of that, that I could probably, uh, I can remember uh, air raids, at least what I can remember is that... Um, carrying a gas mask. Children were required to carry a, a, a gas mask yeah. in a box around your neck on a string. And the reason was in World War I, uh, they used gas against the troops right. and they feared that the Germans might use it they never against did. civilians. But yeah. of course, no, it didn't happen, yeah. but everybody had a gas mask, even little babies. Now, when uh, um, you, you're up in Yorkshire, um, were there ever any air raids up there? Oh, yes. Oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. That's our north? My grandmother lived in the Midlands in a town called Chesterfield, and Sheffield was a big industrial right. city. Leeds, these were all big, they met a lot of mills and uh, steel and things mm -hmm. like that, mines. They were bombed. And my grandmother said when she was in Chesterfield, uh, I can't, I'm not sure how many miles it was between Sheffield and Chesterfield, but she could see the whole of the city lit up. Wow. And my grandmother um, was probably in her 50s. She worked in a munitions factory, but she was an inspector of um, oxygen tubes that the pilots took up in the aircraft. Mm -hmm. And she was very proud of her war service. And she had three, she, my grandmother had three sons. And my, my mother was a nurse, and my three uncles were all in fighting men. Yeah. Um, and yes, and we. Um, as far as this, the war, when, the, when, the, when there was an imminent raid, the sirens would go mm -hmm. off. You would hear them. And Where then everybody would run to the uh, air raid shelter. Okay. Yeah. And they were usually, sometimes they were low underground. They were usually damp and cold. 
Um, and my mother made us something called siren suits, which were one-piece jumpsuits with a zipper up the front. And you would put them on over whatever you were wearing. If you were in bed at night, mm -hmm. you'd put them over your night, night clothes. Um, and we lived in that little village. I don't remember... And, and children accept... Children accept what they experience. They don't question right. it. This is life, you know. We sort of vaguely knew there was a war on. Um, what I do remember more vividly is post-war Britain because the rationing and um, and there was very very strict rationing in in London, in England um, post during the war and post-war. In fact, bread became rationed after the war. Nineteen fifty-one. Kind of, yeah. 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 Um, uh, so you were living up in Yorkshire. Yeah. Now, when were you allowed to return to London? It wasn't that we were allowed to. It was that the war was over. I know, yeah. And we came back. Now, that period, the post-war, immediately war period, uh, we had a big problem because there were a lot of us. There were four, four or five children and my parents. Um, there was no housing to be had. Right. So for a while, we, the family was completely split up. And I actually went to an orphanage for a few months. But you um, were together up in the auction. We were all, we, yes. Yeah. Were you living with another family? No, we there? were living nope. in a small working class village in what was called two up and two down. It's a, a mm -hmm. small row house that was built for the mill, mill workers. It had no internal plumbing. Well, I had running water, but the toilets were all at the end of the street. Mm -hmm. And you literally had to get out of bed and go down the street if you needed to go. Yeah. Uh, I do, what I do remember from living in that village, it was called Gumasol, was that um, we had a street party when, when Victory Day came, yeah. VE Day, Victory in Europe. And that was the very first time as children we ever ate jello and cream and cake because there just wasn't any available. Yeah. We had very limited diet. Um, and I have to say that also we were quite healthy because we got very little sugar. Mm -hmm. We all had good teeth. Mm -hmm. um, and there wasn't any obesity. <laughs> but but you, had, you had ample food, though. We had plain food. Plain food. Yes. Yeah, People but, but, had, uh, they grew vegetables and things in allotments right, in uh, little right. victory gardens, yes. I think you call them here. Um, I can remember, anyway, I'm, just, I'm jumping around a bit That's here. That's fine. That's all right. Um, after the after the, the period the post immediate post war period the um, family got split up. My mother was pregnant with her fifth child. She went to a home for unmarried mothers to have that baby, which must have been horrifying to her, being a respectable married woman with a family. <laughs> and one brother, uh, I went to an orphanage down on the. I was taken down to the south the south coast on the train with my father and left in this. And it was an orphanage out like Annie, you know, in the movie Annie with the little iron beds. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if I was, you know, it was very distressing because I didn't know yep. whether I was ever going to come back. Now, when we came back to London, I was about six. And we lived, and there was no housing. There was everything. Right. It was flattened. Not the whole the big city, but right. the but, where... But we, your prior home had been we, destroyed too? Well, we didn't own a house, but no, the but whole neighborhood was living flattened. Living quarters, yeah. yeah. We were not a wealthy family. We were poor. Mm -hmm. And um, the parts of London that had got the most damage were places like the docks, which yeah, is, you know, where we might have they lived. They were targets. So we put us to live in, a, in um, the whole family. My mother had a new baby and... The four, uh, my th other three brothers and me, <clears throat> we lived in a, re well, they called it euphemistically a rest center, which ah. was a homeless shelter. <laughs> and the funny thing about it was it was in, it was in a hotel on Bayswater Road. And I don't know if you've been to London, but Bayswater Road is opposite Hyde Park near Marble Arch, very elegant, very wealthy fair area. I think the government requisitioned the hotel and we slept, our room for the whole family it was the dining room of the hotel. And my mother, uh, it was a big open space, and no, no privacy. And she, I remember she hung old army blankets up from the ceiling. So to make a sort of room, bedroom, it's cordoned off a little bit of the room. And we had our meals there, and we went to school in that area. And... Um, I do remember sitting on the... We used to play in Hyde Park, which was literally across the main road. 
and um, we, a lot of American soldiers were still around, and there was a wall outside the hotel, and we used to sit, and they would give us gum and candy as they went by. We thought they were wonderful. And I remember getting a food package from America, and it had all sorts of things we'd never eaten. We really? didn't know what they were, so yeah, that was quite funny. Um, and then uh, we were there for a few months, and then we moved. They did rehouse us into a modern, newly built flat apartment. And my father worked for mostly, uh, he did work for local housing authorities and that. So he, then we moved again. We moved a few times. I, I had several addresses in London. And eventually we ended up, when I was about... Let's see, 11. We moved into the country for a while and then we came back into the low area in Essex, it's around London. Um, but we ended up in the east end of London, which is where all the war damage was. And I do remember going to school there through literally streets and streets and streets of rubble and bombed mm -hmm. out houses. And the thing about that was um, the bombs had sometimes sliced the front of the house and left the rooms intact. Yeah, I've so seen you would that, see, you would look up and you'd see wallpaper with mm -hmm. pictures on it. Uh, you know, on the it, like, mm -hmm. like the bomb had just happened, and the bathtub hanging at a funny angle. And they, there was a war film that came out that was very popular called *The Cruel Sea*. I don't know if you remember a British film. Don't one. remember that. No. And it was about the war. And they came and filmed the scenes where there'd been a bombing. They didn't have to have a set. Mm -hmm. They just right. used the street. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay. And my brother, my four brothers, four of them, uh, they were tough little street kids, you know. They used to go everywhere, all over the place. And they, uh, one of them walked across the beam of a second floor of a house and fell off it and knocked himself unconscious. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, precocious lad, precocious was he? Precocious he was, yeah. So we had a, it was um an interesting time. We not didn't know any better. Not a normal childhood. Not a no It was not <laughs> Downton Abbey. But but you survived it. We did. Uh, as a did, family. How did this affect your schooling? When you went to school, did all, everybody was in the same boat? Yeah. Well, the, yes. Yeah, the ch the, children that were displaced by the war were mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and because we moved so much, I actually went to about 10 different schools okay. in my lifetime. And in fact, when I finally got into the academic high school that I got into, um, and I was, we were going to move again. I said, I'm not moving. I'm, I'm staying put. I'm, go, I'm not leaving this school. I think I was about 14 by then. Um, and I did. I traveled from the southwest of London to the east end of London and stayed at that school mm -hmm. till I was ready yeah. to leave. Now, um, I know one of the problems, uh, especially when they were trying to rebuild parts of London, was unexploded bombs. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, still I think they're still, still finding today, them right? occasionally, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, it was a big problem. Um, there's one story I'll tell you that is, is quite funny, really. Um, rather awful when you think about it. My, my, I think children in those days wandered everywhere without any thought of... Yeah. Working class children right. well, would we, wander around did, and, even, and even just here. disappear and come home at supper time. Yeah. And I think that happened. Here. That's exactly right. Yeah. You know, uh, we'd, we'd be told uh, supper is at 530. Yeah. Be here yeah. or you're not eating. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. So we used to wander all over London. And I was the big sister. So I had this little raggle tag of brothers, three of them, the baby, not the baby. And one day we were, do you know the, where Tower Bridge, you've seen pictures of Tower yeah, Bridge. Right. Well, it's called the Pool of London and it used to be a working um, river with, with ships coming in from the ocean. Yeah. And that was the Pool of London is where they emptied their bilges. So it was very mm -hmm. contaminated. But we were little kids, you know, I was probably about 10, I think then. We went swimming in the Pool of London completely unsupervised. We climbed oh, yeah. down some rickety iron steps. The tide, it was a tidal river. Right, okay. So the tide was out and there was a little bit of pebbles and we said, well, that's the beach. So we went down and we were swimming in this greasy, dirty, awful water. And the upshot of that was I got really, really sick and was in the hospital for about three weeks. Oh, dear. So that, that's a funny story. <laughs> well, it wasn't funny at the time. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. And then well. later on, you know, we, we, uh, I, I mean, I, I finished my schooling in the East End. Um, if any of your viewers ever saw um, the series Call the Midwife, it's, it's been on PBS. Mm -hmm. It's about mm -hmm. the midwives in the 50s in the east end of London. And that was 
had a, I think that port painted a very good portrait of what life was like there. Mm -hmm. And there were, it was a very neighborly place. Mm -hmm. When, um, well, this is probably, no, this is silly, but when did you consider London rebuilt? Or did you ever consider it rebuilt? Um, um, there's so probably much Probably when I was a, do an, a young adult, yeah. yeah, even in the 50s. I think in the early, f I think it was like 1951, they had the Festival of Britain and they built a, a whole, a festival hall, concert hall, and all, on the, on the um, it was on the other side of the river from the Houses of Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, so that was like a sign of hope that we were beginning to, to, mm -hmm. to, to rebuild. Come out of the, yeah. Yeah. In, in, in 1951, they went to bread rationing. Yeah. <laughs> My mother did fairly well because uh, with that many children, you got more food. You mm -hmm. know, you, instead of getting two eggs a week, she would get two eat, you know, yeah, for sure. each, one, two for each child. Um, I don't remember, I do remember being hungry. I remember eating a lot of bread and jam, which I still like, unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I wanted to tell yeah. you, uh, um, in 1953, Elizabeth II was crowned. Right. Now, I was living in the, we were living there then, and I was going to this academic, no, I was, yeah, I was going to this, no, I was going to another school. And, uh, <laughs> They, she, the, the East Enders were absolute royalists. They absolutely loved the Queen and the royal family. And that, the whole thing about the coronation was it was everybody, uh, it was a fever that overtook the country for at least a year before the coronation happened. Now, the day after the coronation, the Queen herself and Prince Philip drove in an open I think it was called a Landau, uh, an open carriage mm -hmm. with horses through the east end of London down the main roads. And our school was fairly near that road and they painted a yellow line on the sidewalk for the school children to stand on so they wouldn't be shoved to the back. And where the, where the Queen's carriage was coming and everybody was going bananas, it, the whole crowd surged into the road and stopped the carriage. And I was just a little girl. I was 13, but I was mm -hmm. petite. <clears throat> I got lifted off my feet and thrown into the carriage. About, and my face was literally this far from Her Majesty's, literally. I mean, I was looking her right in the eyes. And she had very blue eyes and beautiful pink and white complexion. And um, she looked horrified and scared. <laughs> <laughs> and a big London bobby sort of picked me up and deposited me, not too gently, but put, pulled mm. me off the carriage, obviously. And the really funny thing about this story is that my, one of my brothers, Colin, one, this is fairly recently we were talking about this incident, and he said the same thing happened to him, but he was on the other side of the road further down, and of course he got Prince Philip. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Her Majesty. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> and he said that there was no gentleness about the way he was yanked <laughs> off the <laughs> yeah. road. So it was a funny story that we yeah. both had the same experience. What, what are the odds against that? I know, uh, very unbelievable. strange. Unbelievable. Yeah. You get recalls at unusual times, going back to your childhood. What? Do you recall things? Unusual Do there certain things? things that trigger? Like sometimes you, I, I, you, at night, you know, you just before you go to sleep, all of a sudden okay. your mind starts traveling back in time. Or, um. I think that as children, we took everything for granted. Okay. We, we, um, I, I don't, I, we didn't have anything to measure anything by. Mm -hmm. You know, we thought life, this is normal life. You play in the street, you go mile, walk off miles and miles yep. with your brothers. I suppose going swimming in the pool of London was pretty unusual. <laughs> that I, wasn't I, something I that children would. When you destroy an infrastructure like it happened to London, how they could keep up with things like mail, knowing where people are and everything. Well, those things weren't affected. I mean, I think, you know, they have that British can-do spirit. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of that. Um, and, you know, Hitler thought that when he blitzkrieged London that he would break people's yeah, spirit. Break spirit. But, in fact, he had the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. they got, they're very united. Yeah. yeah. I, I think what Dwayne was saying is perhaps later in life do you have flashbacks to being a kid in London. Not really. No, no, no. no. I know. I took it in my stride. Because I know exactly what you're talking oh, about. Oh, yeah. I, I because we, we do too. I have dreams. Not if. Uh, yeah, I do have dreams. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
I was going to say every night, but no, 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 sometimes not. But invariably, as a young, I always end up back over the Foxborough Company in the stock room, my first job, yeah. or in Germany when I was over there during the um, I was in the army. Post, post, were you yeah. post war? Yeah. yeah. Uh, those are the two places I always end up. Yeah, I and, don't, I don't. I, I, I have such a good memory, and my memory was very good for those, ti those peri periods of time that I lived there. Um, I will tell you, when you asked me about food, this is kind of funny, we, we certainly were rationed and we didn't have cakes and things mm -hmm. like that. Or if we did have them, we couldn't afford them. And I became, uh, I, I, somebody gave me some American magazines when I was about eight or nine, and of course they had ads for cakes. Mm -hmm. And, and the cakes were, you know, huge. I'd never seen a cake that was that big, layer cakes. And I made a scrapbook of food, and I cut all these pictures out. Your brother came along and I used to sit and look at all these pictures, right? these pictures of food, <laughs> which I'd never had, you know, which were, yeah. British cooking is not known for its... Nor is good. German cooking known for its... Uh, yeah. uh, Great cooking ability, I'll tell you. Oh, God, they're the world's worst cooks. But um, uh, what I was going to, um, uh, what I was also wondering, too, um, and this is probably jumping ahead, but over here on this side of the pond, we always have a lot of trouble getting our head around the royalty. And... and what is this fascination? We don't with the understand. It. We don't understand it. You have I mean, royalty. how can you possibly well, spend you have celebrities? Sort of, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, sometimes. Sort of. But seventy-five or a hundred million dollars a year to this welfare family. What? What? Yeah. Well, I, I, I in some ways, I, I share your sentiment because, uh, but I, you know, you have to admire the Queen, and, and in England, it, it's 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 like the Disney World of history. I mean, you can't walk down a street in England without some very old thing jumping at you. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, th uh, no, I mean, not people. I'm talking about buildings. <laughs> we kind of got that idea. <laughs> oh, maybe that happens. I no, know. I'm very much a, a, a British uh, rooter. I, I'm, yeah. you know, uh, um, a fast, oh, well, I'm about a third English um, and Irish and German. Yeah, that's takes care of that okay. stuff. <laughs> Truth in advertising. Well, uh, um, we, the Queen, I mean, we, Britain's always had a monarchy yeah. for hundreds and hundreds of years. So um, the class system in Britain is interesting. Um, the top of the pile, of course, is the Queen and the aristocratic level, the lords and ladies, uh, Downton Abbey. You know. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then there's a sort of upper middle class. That, and then there's the middle middle class, middle class, and then there's the lower middle class, and then there's the working class, and uh, whatever, whatever. The, 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 the caste and, system is still alive and well, well over there. Well, it was very strong when I was a young woman. In fact, I have to say coming to America was one of the things I did not miss. I didn't find it here in the same way. I think there's sort of a caste system here that's more like money, or old money maybe, and then new money. Whereas in England, it was, it was different. And the interesting thing I found out when I came here, um, in England, if your father had been a working man, like a plumber or mm -hmm. a, <laughs> picking up garbage, you know, whatever, sure. he'd been a, a, a menial dustman. job, a dustman, yes, that's what they call them. Uh, you, you really, in England, you, you wouldn't mention it, but here you'd be proud of it. Mm -hmm. I was like, I, it, and, and that snobbism that was very prevalent in my youth, I think it's much, much better now. There's more egalitarianism. But um, yes, I, I have to say when I came here, I, I thought that was a really good switch. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now, how did you find your way to America? Now, I know uh, you went, to, well, yeah, maybe we'll continue on with your schooling. So my schooling. Well, I went to an academic high school. In England at the time, there was an exam called the 11 plus. Okay. And all children took it. And it depends, now I'm not talking about the aristocratic children who went to private schools, which are known in England as public schools. Very confusing. <laughs> but ordinary children took the 11 plus, And it was a, an exam, actually, that decided your fate for the rest of your life. Because... Um, 
if you passed it, you could mm -hmm. get into an academic high school, which I have to say was called a grammar school, just to make you confu more confused. Are you writing this down? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so if you got into the grammar school, you had a chance of going to university, but not, not a huge chance, cause, but you had a, we had a very small number of working class children went to university. And then if you didn't pass it, you went to what was called a secondary modern school, which is a little bit like a less academic. Trade Kids school. would be going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then there was another class, which was a technical high school. So why am I going with this? Uh, well, I went, actually, I went I was... to the academic high school, and I decided when I was about 12 or 13, I was going to be a nurse. There we go. <laughs> and in the 50s, 40s and 50s, there was very little available for women mm -hmm. um, to go into a profession and have a career of sorts. And uh, you could become a teacher, a librarian. Uh, I'm talking about women who wanted a real job. Um, there were very few women on television. Um, it was, and he, I mean, we, we had very few women doctors, as a matter of fact. I remember very, if it was a woman doctor, you would refer to her as the lady doctor because she was unusual. And you refer to nurses as sister. Yes, so let yeah, me explain that a little all bit. Like that's so anyway, answer. I went into nursing because it was a respected profession. And at the time, it's not like that now. And it was a diploma training. You trained at the hospital. Um, it was very arduous. They paid you a pittance and they worked. You worked, but you also went to school as well uh, for classes. Uh, so you were educated in nursing and you learned, it was more like an apprentice thing. Mm -hmm. But you came out very skillful nurse because you were, it was very gradual what you, you were taught. Um, now the ward sister, that it was the nurse who was in charge of each ward. And she was, um, she ruled the roost. You were terrified of her usually. Um, and that came from the religious, uh, when hospitals were run by the church, mm -hmm, okay. and they were, they were nuns, so they were called mm -hmm. sister. Yeah. So I went to nursing school um, when I was 18. And the first off, I did children's pediatrics, because you could do that as a basic okay. training. And then I did general nursing, and then I did midwifery. Now, while I was doing my pediatric training, we had an exchange program with Children's Hospital in Boston. Really? And we got doctors and uh, some of the nurses came over for, to work at the hospital, to get experience in an English mm -hmm. hospital. So they, uh, <laughs> those doctors were so darn cute and compared to the stuffy English ones. <laughs> and <laughs> they, they all made a fuss of me and said, oh, honey, you've got to come to the States. We love you over there, you know. So I put the idea in my head that maybe mm -hmm. I would. And they came from Boston Children's. Uh, and then I, got, I met a young man, I got engaged, and uh, that put that idea on the back burner. But then I got unengaged. So, Strange, that thing. That yeah, stuff well, like I, that uh, it was my decision. <laughs> so now I was unengaged, and I did not want to become a ward sister, because that was the purview of old maids that we that used was, to call them. That was the limit no, you were of going your to, If you were a mobility. sister, no, no, if you were a sister of a ward, you married your profession. And I wanted to get married and have children. So I thought, well, I'll go to America for a year. And that, I wrote to Children's Hospital and got a job. And I came over. And the funny thing was, I met my husband five days after I was here. I came on Monday and I met him on Saturday. And we just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. Wonderful. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, I know that I had a funny story about when I was a student nurse about Winston Churchill, so I know you'd ask me to say that. Um, so the, the hospital I did my general nursing was called Westminster Hospital. It was a teaching hospital. It was a lovely place. It was wonderful. I loved, I loved every minute of working there, except for one or two ward sisters who didn't like me and I didn't like them, <laughs> but I did love, I did love being there. And um, the National Health, um, which came into being in the 1940s, National Health System, um, so care was free, you paid for it in your taxes, but True. it was free. But there were people, there were wealthy people who didn't want to be in the public wards with the hoi polloi, so they, they were on the private patient's wing and student nurses rotated through there, and I was doing my rotation on the private wing. And we had, Sir Winston Churchill was by then quite an old man. It wasn't too long before he died. 
um, and his wife, Clementine, was in as a patient. She came in. I can't remember what was wrong with her. And we were taking care of her. And one day, the ward sister on that ward was wonderful. And her name was Sister Duff. And she was Scots. And she came and she said, uh, she came flying around like a bat out of hell to all student nurses, yelling at us in her Scots accent, nurses, nurses, would you tidy up? Sir Winston's coming, Sir Winston's coming. T clean it up, t tidy this up. Da -da -da. And she was in a flap. So we all raced around, you know, folding linen and moving things mm -hmm. out of the corridor. And, and I was running around with them, looking, making sure everything was spick and span. And I spotted something which was totally forbo forboten in the hospital, forbidden, uh, which was a male urinal full of urine sitting on a bed table at the end of the man's bed. Mm -hmm. And they were private rooms, all these rooms. And I spied it and I thought, oh dear, oh my goodness. We had a rule in the hospital, uh, we had a room that was where they sterilized all this equipment called the bedpan room, mm -hmm. the sluice room. And we always had to cover anything like that with a white cloth. Sure. And it was, I mean, it was really the worst thing you could do is walk. And I grabbed this urinal just to get it out of the place. And I grabbed it and I turned around and I ran right into Sir Winston's wheelchair. And <laughs> oh, he was, papers. now you have to visualize the scene because the board of governors, and the head, all the big t people at the top of the hospital were all in this profession. And the last person bringing out the line was a porter and he had a half sucked cigar in his hand like this. And they had pushing this wheelchair and in the wheelchair was this little shrimp of a man. I mean, he didn't look very imposing. He was wow. a little, little old man and he would sort of shrunk down. And I ran into the chair with this urine in front of me and the urine went oh. <laughs> And I wished the floor would open up and yeah. swallow me and I put it behind my back like this. And it was just a momentary pause, but everybody sort of stopped and stared. Like, it, and I, I thought, oh, my God, I, I'm going to get the Did you hear any hospital personnel saying, make sure you get her name? Well, I thought that was going to happen, <laughs> but fortunately for me, it didn't. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. That's a great story. Yeah. So, that's know, my, my, the, so my two main people that I've seen are famous are the Queen and Winston. I mean, that's pretty good. <laughs> do you know, um, I personally regard... Winston Churchill is the greatest man of the 20th century. Yeah. Do you feel likewise? Well, if you read about him, he wasn't so great when he was young. And... Uh, he, he saved. He did. He, it was his rhetoric and his doggedness that helped save Britain. No one ever wrote... The written... Was and the a history. better with the written word yeah, than yeah. him. He yeah. was... Poetic while writing history, um, but um, I believe he saved Europe, the Brits, and he leading the Brits. And the ironic thing was, he they kicked him out of office. Yes, he did. Well, that's what I was going to ask you next. Now, would I would have known about that? Why the vitriol? towards him in 1945? They couldn't wait to get rid of him. They, I think they would. Well. It, I'm not sure of my history on this, why, why he was, it, 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 the Labour Party. Nor am I. <laughs> well, the Labour Party, which is sort Clement of vaguely Adley, the right. equivalent of the Democratic yes. Party, was coming, came into power, that we wanted to come into power, and they had the votes, I guess. And they were, they nationalized everything soon after the war. Right. Everything, the railways, the mines, transportation, mm -hmm. the trains. Um, perhaps they wanted a new leaf, something new and fresh. I know that they were tired of the war and misplaced logic. They blamed some of the deprivations of the war on Churchill that, well, he could have ended it sooner or he could have kept us out of it. I don't, or, I've never heard that as a theory. No, but uh, I mean, they were tired of the war. And they Absolutely. wanted to change. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I have to say, London, the, what I do remember post war is it was kind of dreary. There wasn't very much in the shops. You, the clothing was rationed for a long time. You couldn't, there was nothing much to buy. Yeah. Now, now, folks, especially you folks that are my age or older, think of what happened here in the US when the war ended. We went back to normal behavior like that. 
uh, yeah, we, we had to ke play catch up with some of the rationed items. But by 1946, they were building automobiles. Mm -hmm. And we That's had, right. um, and we were building houses, and we didn't have the destruction to right. clean up. Mm -hmm. Well, our biggest problem was unemployment at that point. Yeah, that, that's probably the, the key is the destruction. Our infrastructure was yeah. in place. Yeah. I, plus, we had, a, we had a transition period. They, yeah. did, they didn't have any transition that's period. That's it. It went from completely well, all out to banged in. And they yes, went into a new era. Yes, picking up the pieces, and, real, yeah. literally. And Harry S. Truman said, we are stopping Lend-Lease immediately yeah. after VE Day. And that really hurt the Brits. And the Marshall Plan. Oh, the Marshall Plan saved Europe. Europe. Yeah. Sure. yeah, it saved Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little trickle down to yeah. you guys yeah. too, but um, we th we thought in. I can remember when I was a young teenager thinking everything that came from America was wonderful, and and uh, in fact, my best friend in in my academic school was um, she and I. We loved everything American. Mm -hmm. Remember, remember what the British guys used to say about the Americans <laughs> oh, when yeah. they come <laughs> over? <laughs> yeah. over they're they're overpaid, oversexed, over and over here. here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they all thought that <laughs> when we read, all they thought all the GIs were rich. Well, there were a lot of young English women that went came to America as GI brides. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, of course, true. too, a lot of the uh, guys we had over there were flyers, and they were paid. They were officers. Mm -hmm. They were paid better. Um, and they but, had better fitting uniforms. And they oh, looked, yeah. And they were cute. I mean, uh, <laughs> that ugly khaki <laughs> that the, the British soldiers <laughs> were get, drab. I'll tell you, the British fighting men were brave, Soldiers and did a wonderful job. Oh, the, and the it, airmen, oh, the Battle of Britain. Oh, they took on just tremendous odds, and they won it. Yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. Perhaps that's in the British character. It's an island, and except for 1066, when Norm, mm -hmm. the Norman conquest happened, it had never been conquered by anybody. And uh, there's something. I, I hope it's still there because when I go to England now, I don't get quite the same vibe about it, but there's something in the British character that, that maybe mm -hmm. Winston Churchill epitomized, um, a sort of can-do, well, you remember that, um, was it, what was that saying, they keep uh, something, something and carry on, keep an up. Um, there's it, yeah, this popular uh, now, that sign. Yeah, exactly. Just make do and, make do and mend was another mm -hmm. one. Um, that's exactly. People got very uh, creative, you know, with, and and we're determined not. I think what might have lost the war were the v VE bombs, you know, the rockets that came mm -hmm. over because they would come without any warning. Yeah, all, all of a sudden they just they stopped buzzing. Yes, and then there yeah, would be well, then yeah. you had the, the V twos after that. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they were pure they were the ones rockets, that real rockets. Right. And yeah. They, yeah. they did. They came without totally and, without and warning. You know, um, we have so much to be thankful. For uh, the fact that Adolf Hitler was a terrible leader and made lots of bad decisions, but you know he didn't understand the uh, jet that they had developed. Mm -hmm. That would have been a game changer too. The oh. ME two sixty two. Well, you know, but I was uh, listen. The good Lord was looking out for us all during the war. The um, it's interesting that in, in we're talking about the class system. There were a lot of Nazi sympathizers in the upper classes. There's a lot and, of Nazi and, uh, sympathizers in the U.S. Then. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 We had isolationists, and they were bound and determined we were not going to get involved in that European war. It's, you know, we did that once. We're mm -hmm. not going to do that again, yeah. you know, kind of thing. Um, comment on the national health system, if you will. Well, before, because we have this move here in the U.S. Yeah. to have the government take over yeah. our health system. That's what the pop people in the well, uh, when it mm, when it started, uh, of course, obviously a lot of doctors were really against it. Um, there was a lot of opposition from the medical profession, and then it gradually took hold. I did my nurses' training in an, in under the national health system, and I think that when I was young in the fifties and early sixties doing my training. Uh, I was in the golden age 
Mm -hmm. of the National mm -hmm. Health. Uh, we had we were quite well staffed. Um, patients stayed in for quite a long time. There was no push to get them out of the hospital. Um, it, we had up-to-date equipment. Um, and there was that sense that you just took care of people. Mm -hmm. However, you contrast that with then and now. It, it, the National Health is in serious problems, financial. Mm -hmm. Um, they, I, I did read the other day that because of Brexit, a lot of uh, foreign-born doctors are going back to their own countries, and these are people who consultant surgeons. The other thing that's about the national health that perhaps wouldn't go down well is if you you would you would be allotted a primary care doctor your GP. Now, you might live in a small town and there were three of them, and you could go to one of those three. But if you wanted to see a consultant, this is when I was growing up too, you had to get an appointment, and sometimes it would be a long time before. You, and you couldn't get an appointment with a consultant, anything, eye doctor, whatever you needed, without the, the uh, GP okaying it. Now, that's got really bad. And I hear anecdotally from my friends. Mm -hmm. of, uh, I have one friend who's a nurse. We train together. And she's very committed to the national health, and she's an avid walker. You know, she walks everywhere. She hurt her knee, and um, she said, well, I had to suck up my principles and go private because she was going to have to wait 10 months to see a, a consultant orthopedist, yeah. Yeah. in which time her knee would have got a lot worse. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah, there were some statistics recently um, about that. They were saying, you know, there. There's 20, 25 week waits yeah. to go see a yeah. specialist yeah. about something like back trouble. You know, yeah. Ken is experiencing the same thing. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. In, in fact, one of the uh, big industries in Windsor, on, uh, uh, Michigan, uh, is Canadians coming over to Windsor for treatment. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and uh, a, a fellow was told, uh, and this is, again, uh, I'm, I'm sketchy on this, but he was told he was going to wait approximately six months for back surgery. Came over to Windsor and three days later, he was operated on. Well, my father died, had a, had a stroke, a heart attack with a stroke. He was quite incapacitated. He was in the hospital for several, uh, I think for a couple of months. And then he came home. He died about six months. He had another one. Uh, now, if that had happened here, and my parents didn't have much money, that they, they would have been saddled with an enormous bill. And there were, of course, there was none. Um, it's just when I and I lived here for over fifty years. I've always had health insurance. When I go back to England and I argue with my friends, they 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 think everybody here is living, you know, of the clinging on because that they have no insurance. And I have to explain to them mm -hmm. that we have Medicaid, which so does serve the poor population and Obamacare, and um, Medicare for adult uh, seniors. Yeah. And most people carry it with their job. Now, that's not to say everybody does, and there is a huge pool of people who sure. don't. So I don't understand why, I didn't understand when Obamacare came out, why Everybody had to change instead of just giving it insurance to the people to who the really didn't have it. Didn't have it seemed it. very practical to and me. It would seem to me an entry level insurance policy could be developed that would have been inexpensive, that would have been affordable as the Affordable Care Act uh, pretended to be, that would take care of those that needed a safety net. Yeah. Um, or, or, um, Catastrophic insurance. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Or long-term long care for the elderly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's ridiculous now to consider long care. I mean, you simply can't afford it. And then the insurance companies take the contract and tear it up and say, oh, well, we can't do that anymore. Yeah. Costs have gone up too much. Here's your new payments. I mean, what the hell kind of a deal? Why sign a contract? Well, uh, my husband and I happen to have long-term health insurance, and it's it, we've had several rate hikes in it mm -hmm. since we took it out. Yeah. And the thing is, if you give it up because you say, well, I can't I know. Read, yep. then you lose all the money that you've already yeah. put yeah, into you, it. You just, so yep. they've really got you over a barrel. They've really truly. And, and there's a lot of inequities in this. In actually, there's inequities in both systems. And there are problems in both systems. Mm -hmm. I, 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 
somehow it's got to be worked out. Sort of do you go back? I do. I know, I know you go back periodically. I do. But do you, you and Frank ever go back, like, tell Frank, well, this is where I was when I was a, a child oh, yes, and go down yeah. this street? Well, and, because we move so many times yeah. and we look at the map of the subway, I mean, I can, in England, the tube, they call it, in right. London. Oh, I live there, I live there, oh, I live there. That was a nurse. I was there in that hospital. And I, you know, it's amazing how many places I, yes. And uh, we, it, we have friends. Probably, I know I go back sometimes when I'm from the Midwest. And I, I remember something a certain way. Yeah. And I go back after 50 years and I thought, well, that wasn't that big. <laughs> you know, I remember this thing was just huge, but uh, it was just nothing or else. I said, I don't remember this anymore. I just, it's different. My, I, one of my sons, Kate, we, we were in, happened to be in London and he asked me, we were, we were at the Tower of London and he said, I'm tired of the tourist bit. Why don't you take me and show me the London that you grew up in? Okay, yep, that would be so we got on the tube and we went to the East End where I, where I went to school. And when we came out, uh, it was Whitechapel, which is in, in, the, in Stepney. And we came out, and, and I, I, I just stood there on the pavement blinking because it was so different. Uh, first of all, there was a big hospital there called the London Hospital, which, had been, which was pitch black from the, you know, all the burning and the, the destruction in the ward that discolored it. And it had been cleaned, and it was honey-colored. It was amazing. And secondly, the main thing was that main road there, um, commercial, Mile End Road it was called, was full of, uh, when I grew up there, was full of uh, bar what they called barra boys, people who sold pots and pens. And, okay. and now th they were still there, but they were all Asian and they were selling sari. So it was brilliant colors everywhere and um, non-white non Londoners mm -hmm. selling them. And then there was a very Jewish area and there were lots of uh, Jewish tailors and uh, synagogues and things. And they were all gone and there was a huge mosque. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, they, they were big changes. Sure, oh, yeah. Just the, yeah. the population change and, you know, the different ethnic group living there now. Which brings us to immigration. <laughs> oh, dear, yes. <laughs> uh, that, well, it's a heck of a problem for England uh, as well yeah, as is. continental Europe um, and the U.S. It, controlling it, you know, the British still have the British Empire. Uh, rules where if you're from mm -hmm. India or whatever, that you can come to uh, England without well, I, paperwork, I did, essentially. In the, in the 50s, I can't remember which prime minister it was, said if, you had a, if you'd grown up in a colonial, British colonial country like uh, Ghana or um, the Caribbean, mm -hmm. or, you could come to live in England. And I remember it was like overnight... The floodgates opened and we yeah. had all the... Now, I grew up in a lily-white culture. There was very few um, people of color in my, in wherever I lived. I think maybe in my entire school there was one girl who was black and the rest were lily-white, right? So all of a sudden we had this influx of, of people from other countries. Um, and it, it, as a nurse, you... you, you doesn't affect you in that way. You you have patients, you take them in, you look after them, mm -hmm. no matter what, what color they are. But it caused a huge social dislocation and a lot of problems. And And I remember when I came to this country, one of my friends said, oh, how could you live in such a racist country? And I remember writing back to her and saying, well, when these children of immigrants that have come into our country and to grow up, you're going to have the same sorts of problems because they don't want to stay sweeping the streets and doing menial jobs. They're exactly. going to want more out of society. And in fact, what I didn't want it to happen, but it turned out that I was absolutely right because if you remember, they had race riots in oh, London. Absolutely. In Notting Hill and like absolutely. And they, and they brought curry with them. And they weren't? They brought curry with them. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Big thing in England. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. <Yeah. laughs> um, Lots so of Indians. Let me ask you this. Um, uh, probably an unfair question, but uh, Brexit. It's any, hard for me any, to form any an thoughts on, on that? that? Well, I, my brothers, working class men, uh, were very for it. I think it might be, I don't understand the ins and outs of it. I, I, the younger generation didn't want it, like my mm -hmm. nieces said. We're European, you know, that's how they regarded themselves. And they like the ability to go to the Europe continent without a passport, sure. you know, I mean, to constantly step at borders. But 
There's also that element of another country, which was Brussels, head of the EU, making rules and regulations about um, the size of bananas, the size you know, of eggs, right, right. And how much butter fat you can have in milk. Yeah. And, and it comes from an out, you see, that's that British bloody yeah, mindedness, yeah. you know, sure. they don't. So there's an element of that, yeah. I think. Yeah. Oh, I agree. And then I think with the immigrant problem, um, large swaths of cities of, uh, bec you know, become um, mixed use. Mi <laughs> no, they've they've changed. They're at, they're now. Yeah, I, it's very hard on television to sort of say what well, you want to say. I, I, but yeah. I don't wish to. I don't wish to offend anybody. But large areas of England now are Muslim, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, there. There is, there is this, to my mind. You've got Europe, all these little countries, and if there's one thing that uh, takes place here, it's nationalism. They are very nationalistic. Here, uh, no, in Europe, the Germans are nationalistic about their country. Mm -hmm. The French are nationalistic about their country. The Brits are nationalistic about their country. The Swedes are, and so on. And I think that that is the fallacy of EU. Oh, we're going to take you all and put you in a hopper, and we're going to stir you up, and guess what? It's a chocolate frap. Yep. Uh, well, I think, I think what's happened in, because of that a lot of countries feel they're losing their national identity. Well, so this is what I was French, This is what I was poorly trying to explain. Yeah, they, you know. they feel that um, the things that made them unique and special mm -hmm. are being, well, and we have it here. We yeah. have it here when you go to another state and you driving down a street and you say, if I didn't know which state I was in, I could be in Massachusetts. Not because of the topography, but because of all the stores and the sameness yeah, of the everything. the sameness, the uniformity right. of everything. Um, See, I guess what I'm getting at is nationalistic is not prejudice, I don't think. It's, you know, no, it, I uh, so. but yet nationalistic countries are being branded racist and, uh, well, as, you know, um, you've got to meld it all together and all of that. I don't see what's wrong with the Czechoslovakians, uh, the Czechs, or the Greeks, or what, retaining their heritage and being proud of their country. And I think that's the, the falling down of the EU. It's going to force them all to become uh, a toss salad. Well, the world is in a state of flux, and it always has been. We just, you know, we've been through the last century with two major world wars and a huge move of population from one place to another. And as far as this country, I mean, I'm an immigrant. Now, I came here in, in order to work. I, ha I got a job before I came. But before I came, I had to spend quite a bit of money, actually. And I had to go and get um, um, my green card. Yeah, get yeah. And, and, right. entrance visas yeah. and uh, all of that so sort of thing. I don't like the idea of people just walking in as exactly. if they, could, they have the right to do it. I think that there's yeah, to be a we proper have a process. We have a system. You stand in line, and you wait until your number it's is called. Right, yeah. And these people that are trying to come across the border want to move ahead of all these other people. And that's wrong. No, I'm going to just be oh. devil's advocate oh, because right. uh, we are also short of workers in this country. Farm workers, for instance, they're having a hard time, people picking crops. And this is a vast country. When you fly over it and you look down... <laughs> Good. It's, I've been in the air for seven hours and I haven't got to the other side yet. You know, do you know what I mean? There's a oh, yeah. feeling of vastness that we could absorb more people. Uh, uh, unfortunately, where do we absorb them in, 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 if they live in the cities? Got to, it, we've got to do it legally. I mean, we've yeah, got to make sure I, I, we know I, who's coming and what they are, where they're coming from. I think most sensible people think that. And I think you can think with your head. That's your head thinking. Your heart says, you know, some... We have to help people out. Well, yes. Well, yes. But, and I don't have any problem with us sending money to Mexico or sending money to Uruguay. Or I think we've done a pitiful job of helping out our neighbors in South and Central America, but a lot to be of honest those, with you. A lot of those southern, uh, uh, yes. southern hemisphere countries 
are run by as dictatorships. Yes, they they all are. And you can't send money and then it just gets sucked That's up by the, the it problem. Never gets to where it's supposed to go. Do you know that the Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And we cannot send money there no. because it goes to the government and then it is, mm -hmm. uh, there's a dictatorship there and it never ever gets to the people. And that's the pity of this whole mess. Um, by gosh, by golly, I don't know. I guess I'm gonna have to run for president and solve it, my man. You gonna be vice president? I might as well. Might as well. I'll be Secretary of State. There you go. There we go. I think we've uh, managed to figure yeah. this out. I did um, become a citizen, by the way, so oh, I can wave my little flag. Oh, good, good. <laughs> yeah. When did you become a citizen? I became a citizen in 19... 1977. Good. When I was pregnant with my last child, and I remember going in to this... where you, the, uh, soup, where you go and get mm -hmm. processed, and I said to the man in the suit, you're getting two for the price of one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they, they uh, I, was, I was quite happy to, and I did want to vote and take part in the political process. Sure. And I knew I couldn't do that yeah. if I didn't have a, I wasn't a citizen. Plus, my husband's an American and my children are American. So. Mm -hmm. Pretty much tied down here, but. I am, I don't fun, think I'm going fun, back. <laughs> fun to go back and visit though, isn't it? Isn't yeah. And I've done well here. I mean, my, my family regard mm -hmm. me as the, you know, I don't think Plus, you know, the rich American. Coming in as a naturalized citizen, you know more about this country and the political system and the history than most people that live here, yeah. born here. Well, I read a great deal. I'm yeah, interested I in do, history uh, and reading. Yeah, We're pathetic on knowledge of our own history. Oh, yeah, even sometimes. college students. College students, oh. unbelievable. You see some of these polls, the questions that they ask and the well, stupid answers they yeah. have. It is silly. Yeah, it is. It really is. Um, but my husband likes history, and I do too, so mm -hmm. we do Wonderful. learn. Wonderful. We do. Wonderful. Any other stories you'd like to leave us with before we have to I'm wind this up? Uh, an exit story, perhaps? An exit story. Oh, dear, you put <laughs> me on the spot. Um, well, let me think. Well. I... I Oh, I'll tell you a funny story about becoming a citizen. First of all, I, I took things very seriously and I got a high school. They told me I had to learn a lot of stuff about history, mm -hmm. about American history. So I bought a high school textbook and I could tell you all about the Louisiana Purchase and da 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 right. da, da and Jefferson and blah, blah, blah. When I went for the test, they asked me, who was the first president? I mean... Yeah. Come on. And who was the current president, which I think was Mr. Bush, who just passed away. Um, and that was about it. I passed. They, they dumbed it down a little bit? That was very dumb. And they asked me about the what, how many stars and stripes, which I got backwards, and they let me in. <laughs> and, and we were at this... It was actually very moving to become a citizen. We were in a, a big court, court in Pittsfield. Surrounded by what I used, I would like to say, assorted aliens. Because when you had a green card, every January you had to go to the post office and register okay, as right. an alien, and wrap up. She said, <laughs> "Yeah." And anyway, so that it was very moving to become a Wonderful. citizen, and I'm, it's right. something I've never regretted, and I've never Good. regretted coming to America. I really we're glad you did. Do we're like it. Very glad you did. And we're very, very glad that you came to our show. You're welcome. Yeah. Good and luck with the perhaps, future ones. Uh, as we uh, develop this whole format, we'll invite you back again. Okay. Good for you. Well, wonderful. Brenda, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, and folks, I hope you enjoyed our little show. And uh, we're going to try some more of these right. kinds of things here. And Ferret out the truth about what goes on in here Under in those Park. suburban lands. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> well, folks, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll catch you later. Be careful. Mm -hmm.